Getting to Disney World isn't a hop, skip, and a jump away for everyone. Most guests will have to travel long distances to reach the most magical place on Earth. So how can you improve your travel experience and make sure things are easy? Stick with us and we'll give you 50 different tricks and tips from our combined decades of travel experience that we know are going to help. Hey everybody, it's AJ for Disney Food Vlog, and today's video is all about travel. Whether you're heading to Disney World via car or a plane, you'll want to make sure your trip goes as smoothly as possible, which is why we've come up with this ultimate list of travel tricks that will make your lives easier and your stress levels manageable. And of course, we've got some theme park tips in here as well. This is definitely a list you're going to want to have close by while you're planning, so go ahead and drop your email at DisneyFoodBlog.com slash easy travel so we can send the full PDF of this list your way for free. Tip number one, bring cash. There may come a time when your debit or credit card wants to rebel against you on vacation, or a certain place you're trying to make a purchase is gonna be cash only. Since COVID times, these places are becoming less prominent, but they can sneak up on you when you least expect it. Whatever the case may be, it is nice to have some cash on hand wherever you go. And this includes international destinations as well. But a secondary tip here is don't wait to get cash after you arrive at your destination. Do it before you head out. ATMs in a different state or a different country don't always vibe with the debit card from your hometown bank. Or if you're traveling from overseas, don't always vibe with the credit card from your hometown bank. I've landed in two situations where I have not been able to get needed cash when I arrived in different countries and had to scramble to figure out a solution. So make sure you have multiple ways to pay instead of relying solely on your card to take care of you. And know that in some places and some countries, there's a lot more cash only going on than there is here in the States. One of the places I had a problem was in the Bahamas while I was on a Disney cruise. I could not use my card in the ATM to get cash. So this can absolutely be a Disney travel problem as well. Next tip on our list, book your hotel directly. It's tempting to book a hotel room through a third party website like Expedia or Priceline when they promise great discounts. But there are a couple of major catches you need to consider. If there's a reason you need to cancel your hotel stay, you won't be able to just call up the hotel yourself. You'll have to go through the third party agency, which could mean long call times and several extra hoops to jump through that might not even lead to what you were hoping to accomplish. And if you're part of a loyalty program for the hotel you're wanting to book, you might end up missing out on rewards points by not booking directly through the hotel website. Third-party agencies aren't bad and they really can save you money, but just remember you might be missing out on other hotel benefits when you choose this route. And changes and cancellations could be much different and sometimes incur fees. Get temporary tattoos. When you're at the airport, you're gonna be surrounded by hundreds of strangers who are waiting around for their next flight. And when you're in Disney World, you're surrounded by thousands of strangers and your kids are going to be very, very excited and ready to run around. Either way, you're gonna be surrounded by people you don't know in places you don't know. And that can be problematic if you've got a runner, a kid who wants to get away and go explore. Hopefully this isn't something you have to worry about ever, but just to be on the safe side, invest in temporary temporary tattoos that have your name and phone number on them. You can put these tattoos on your kid's arm before you travel, and that way if someone else does find your kid if they've wandered off, they'll be able to directly contact you. You can find customizable temporary tattoos in a pack of four on Amazon for around five bucks. Definitely bring those important prescriptions in your carry-on. Lost or delayed luggage is gonna come up multiple times in today's video because it happens at airports more often than you want to admit. If for some reason your checked luggage hasn't yet arrived or it's lost somewhere out in the void, then you want to make sure any important prescription drugs aren't gonna be lost along with it. Pack medications and inhalers in your carry-on or personal bag so you don't have to worry about not having them with you. Because trust me, you do not want to have an asthma attack at a time when your inhaler is not easily accessible, especially if you've got a kid who's going through that. Very, very scary. Bonus note, if you have any medications that need to be refrigerated and you arrive at your hotel before your room is ready, the front desk should be able to refrigerate your medication for you. Just ask. Think twice before you pack your personal bag or your carry-on. There's a lot of things that you might want to make sure go in there. First of all, of course, your ID, your boarding pass, anything you're going to need to get through the TSA line. Next is, of course, things you're going to need on the plane. Things like headphones, earbuds, snacks, books, your electronic devices. And then make sure you've got in your carry-on or personal bag whatever you might need at the airport before you pick up your luggage. You can save yourself a lot of time and save people behind you in line a lot of time if you make sure your personal bag is packed appropriately before you head out. 
This next one is one I feel very, very strongly about. You all know I'm a pretty private person and I really don't understand why people decide to kind of skip this travel rule. Don't put your full address on your luggage tags. So your luggage tag might have a lot of sections for you to fill out, including your name, your address, your city, your state, your phone number, your email. And you may think, yeah, if my luggage gets lost, I want the person who finds it to be able to get in contact with me as easily as possible so I can get my stuff back. But no, no, you don't. You don't want someone to find your luggage to be able to contact you in multiple different ways. And you especially don't want them to be able to go to your house. All you need to fill out is your last name and phone number. You don't need some creep stumbling across any more details than that. In the same vein, be careful with embroidering or engraving engraving your name or your kids' names onto bags and backpacks. Nobody needs to know your kids' names, nor do you want a lot of strangers to know your kids' names in the first place. Instead, consider embroidering their initials onto these bags and still give them that personal flair without giving too much information away. Have a map of the airport or airports you're going to be going to. Connecting flights go one of two ways. Either you have plenty of time to kill before the next one, or you immediately get off your first flight and have to rush over to make it to your second gate. If you have a tight connection and you're landing in an airport you're unfamiliar with, make sure you have a map of the airport handy. Airport directories should be posted around the airport, but knowing where you're going before you land can help maximize your time making it from point A to point B. Most airlines, especially the bigger ones, should have their wayfinding maps on on their website. And when I googled MCO map, the very first search entry led me directly to the page I needed to go to find their PDF map download at Orlando International Airport, which is super nice to have on hand, since MCO is a rather expansive airport with a whole lot of ways to get lost, if you're not careful. But this can also be incredibly handy if you're flying into an international airport you've never been to before, especially if you have a connecting flight. And of course, I'm always concerned about where I'm going to be able to eat in the airport, so these maps will also direct you to the best places for food. This next one is very near and dear to my heart personally. Research places to feed your kid. If you're a new mom who's currently in the pumping or breastfeeding stage, digital airport maps can be more important than just getting you gate to gate. They can also help you track down nursing rooms or nursing pods. MCO has a nursing pod in Terminal B. You can find it on the second level right next to baggage claim. And this type of pod doesn't have a whole lot of room, but it does give you enough space and privacy to feed your baby before moving moving on to the next leg of your trip. These pods didn't exist when I had an infant, and so I found myself sitting in a bathroom stall with a pump trying to gather breast milk, and that's just gross. So I'm so glad that there are nursing pods available now, and those of you who are new moms don't have to go sit in bathroom stalls to take care of your children anymore. You should definitely take advantage of free hotel offerings. As you're driving on down the road, you may need to stop at a halfway point, finish up the next stretch of the trip when you're recharged and rested, meaning you may have to book a hotel room along the way. Chain hotels aren't going to be as pricey as you'll find on Disney property, but they can still be costly, which is why it's best to take advantage of any complimentary perks they might want to throw into your stay. Some hotels still offer up free continental breakfast, and if those breakfasts have to be paid for, you might still get a discount code for a certain percentage off your meals or a free item of your choosing. You may also get drink vouchers that'll give you free soda, water, tea, or an alcoholic beverage. If it's offered, you might as well use it instead of lose it since you're technically paying for the whole package anyways. I'm a big fan of taking advantage of any free water bottles I can get. I'm a member of a few hotel loyalty programs and some of those programs give you two free water bottles when you stay at a hotel, so I will definitely grab those and take them with me on the road. If you can, try to get a seat toward the front. Some airlines let you pick your economy seat for free. Others may charge you a few dollars extra for the privilege of choosing where you want to sit for the duration of your trip. Either way, if you get the opportunity to choose, try choosing a seat closer to the front of the plane rather than towards the back. Why? Well, a couple of reasons. First off, passengers with seats at the front sometimes get to board first, depending on your airline, meaning more opportunities for more overhead compartments for your carry-ons. This can be super important if you'll be on a full flight, since overhead space does fill up, and that'll leave your carry-on homeless. More on that later. Secondly, if there's been a flight delay and making it to your connecting flight is going to be tight, then being able to get off the plane as quickly as possible is going to be a more difficult feat if you're sitting in the back rather than towards the front. By the way, if you're on a super delayed flight, and you know that there are a lot of people on that flight who have connecting flights, just stay in your seat a little bit extra so that they can get off the plane first. This happens a lot in Dallas where I'm from because Dallas is definitely a hub for connecting flights. And if I don't have a connecting flight and I'm just headed home, I will just stay in my seat till everyone else gets off the plane because I don't want to keep anyone from getting to their next gate as quickly as they can. 
Don't forget to let your bank know where you're going and when you're traveling. So let's go back to the very beginning of this video because you might still be thinking, okay, why would my credit or debit card decide to rebel on me in the first place? Well, many times if your card is failing to complete a transaction, it has less to do with the card and more to do with your bank or with your credit card company. If your bank or card company notices that your card has made multiple pricey purchases in another state, they may flag it as fraud and shut down your card to protect your account. And that's great that they do that, except if your bank doesn't warn you about this ahead of time, it can be panic inducing. What you're gonna wanna do is talk to your bank or your credit card company before your trip to let them know that yes, you will be out of town and yes, you really did mean to spend $200 at the World of Disney gift shop. Hey, it happens to the best of us. That way your bank can make a note of this and when they start seeing those big purchases being made, they'll know the reason and leave your card alone unless you tell them otherwise. If your card does get deactivated while you're on vacation, you should be able to call and get it reactivated again. But if you have your account linked to your phone number, you might just get an automatic text asking you if you approve of a purchase or not, which would make the solution to your problem as easy as typing in yes or no. If you can check in before you get to the airport, you should do it. Sure, you could wait to check into your flight once you get to the airport, but why waste time waiting in long lines for those check-in kiosks when you could complete your check-in within seconds from the comfort of your own home? 24 hours before your trip, you should get a notice from your airline in the form of an email or text or app notification that you're all clear to check into your flight. Just follow the steps or link that the airline provides and it should lead you right where you need to go to check in early. This way you can get your boarding tickets sent straight to your phone without having to worry about getting them printed when you're at the airport. I also like to download my plane tickets to my Apple wallet if they're sent to me, just so I can access them easily and quickly at all times. Sometimes I'll also take a screenshot of my ticket so it's easy to pull it up, even if Wi-Fi is being difficult. Don't forget to pack those travel snacks. You will make pit stops during your road trip. You will need to make pit stops during your road trip because sitting in a car for too terribly long without a stretch break isn't good for anyone. But to avoid purchasing something at every pit stop you make, or at least purchasing a lot of some things to keep you fed and curb the snack cravings, remember to pack snacks ahead of time. Some of our favorite travel snacks include ready to drink protein shakes, apples, preferably unsliced so they don't brown as quickly, but you can get pre-sliced apple packages at your local grocery store too, peanut butter crackers, crackers, almonds, pecans, peanuts, basically any kind of bag nuts, beef jerky, though some of those really smell potent, so be prepared for someone in the car to blame you for stinking up the car, dried fruit, trail mixes, bag chips, the list goes on. Not only will these snacks keep you not hungry, and honestly, give you something to do, but they'll also keep you from paying premium snack prices during the next hotel stay. That's right, Disney World's not the only place making their everyday snacks pricier, and they can also be a lot less cheaper than the snacks you would have to pay for at the airport if you're traveling by air for this trip. Consider booking your flights on weekdays. It's not just cheaper to visit Disney World on weekdays, it's cheaper to travel on weekdays a lot of the time too. According to NerdWallet, purchasing economy tickets on Tuesdays are about 24% lower than peak prices on Sundays, which translates to savings of about $85 per ticket. Now this may not always be the case, there are some discrepancies like the day of the week when certain holidays fall, but a general rule of thumb is that weekend travel is more convenient for passengers, therefore making flights in higher demand, which in turn makes prices go up. So if you want to potentially save money on your plane seat, try booking a flight for Tuesday or Wednesday instead of Saturday or Sunday. But in many cases, flying in the middle of the week, like on Tuesday or Wednesday, can potentially save money on your plane ticket. Now, when it comes to when to book those plane tickets, that's definitely a mixed bag, but setting price alerts can definitely help. Definitely check the TSA rules for lost items. Let's say you get through the security checkpoint and accidentally forget to pick up one of your bags or electronic devices from the TSA security checkpoint. What then? If you have your phone number located somewhere on your abandoned item, security should be able to give you a call and let you know that you're missing something important. But if they're not able to get hold of you, items will be sent to the airport's lost and found location. Now Cassie here at DFB is very well versed with this because she has left her ears at TSA, but thankfully she got them back. MCO's lost and found is located in Terminal B across from the food court area. If you realize before you leave the airport that you're missing a crucial item in your inventory, you can head to lost and found and describe the item you're looking for. If it's there, then yay. You can now be reunited with your stuff. But if it's not, it's always good to check back later. Even if you have a flight to catch, you can still reach out to MCO and fill out an online form describing what you've lost. You can find this form by searching for Orlando International Airport or MCO on the TSA's Lost and Found page on their 
website. I'll link it in the description below for you. If the Lost and Found office can find your stuff once you're back home, you can get it shipped back to you for a price. Unlike Disney World, which will ship lost items to your home for free if found. Lost and Found offices across all airports will typically hold items for 30 days before disposing of them. And if they have to dispose of lost electronics, they will wipe the memory of the device clean and destroy it to protect the personal info of the original owner. Speaking of electronics, we have got a lot of electronics around here and a lot of cords. So invest in a travel cord organizer. This is a perfect Christmas gift for anybody this year. My charging cords tend to get tangled so tightly that I could earn a Boy Scout badge for not tying without even trying. So instead of stuffing your phone cords and laptop cords and earbuds loosely in your personal bag, where they have the potential of getting twisted and damaged, because those are really expensive, y'all, spend a few bucks on a travel cable cord organizer. You can find these at most chain electronics stores or big box stores. You can also find them online. Amazon's got them for around 12 to 20 bucks. These organizers fit multiple charging cords and cables, USBs, memory cards, any other important piece of tech you don't want ruined after hanging out at the bottom of your bag with whatever other treasures you keep hidden in there. All right, I love this next tip. I think it is super, super, super useful, especially if you're traveling through Orlando International Airport. Reserve your spot in security at Orlando International Airport. MCO is pretty notorious for having longer than usual security lane waits, especially during peak seasons. But you can actually reserve your spot in the security line ahead of time through MCO Reserve. The free reservation line called MCO Reserve allows you to make a reservation, show up at that time, scan in, and go through an exclusive and shorter security line. To do this, go to reserve.clearme.com 72 hours before your flight. You'll be able to reserve a spot if you're planning on getting into the security line between 5 a.m. and 11 a.m. And by the way, for those of you asking, this is run by Clear, which is that paid system to cut down your wait time at the security lines, but this is completely free. So don't worry about it. You don't have to pay for Clear to use this. Definitely avoid overpacking. We've got some tips to do it. If you're planning on taking a checked bag with you onto your flight, try not to get too carried away with what you put in there. A checked bag gives you more room for clothes, shoes, and potentially lots of souvenirs to bring back with you, but you could be charged extra if your bag ends up being too heavy. Here are some of the checked bag fees across a few popular airlines that prove my point. Spirit Airlines charge $59 per bag if it weighs 41 to 50 pounds and $99 per bag that weighs 51 to 100 pounds. American Airlines and Delta Airlines are going to charge passengers 100 bucks per bag if they weigh between 51 and 70 pounds and $200 per bag if they weigh between 71 and 100 pounds. And United Airlines will charge $200 per bag weighing up to 70 pounds and a whopping $400 per bag if it's 71 to 100 pounds. Pretty much any airline you fly with is going to tack on the extra fees for overpacked bags, so make sure you read up on your particular airline's check bag policies ahead of time. If you're nervous your bag is really pushing it into dangerously heavy territory, you might want to invest in an electric portable luggage scale to check for yourself. We tend to prefer the eTech City luggage scale off Amazon. It's about 12 bucks plus shipping and handling. Got great reviews and it's not a bad price. My favorite tip for overpacking, by the way, this is one I used when I used to live overseas, is lay out everything you want to bring and then take half of it. <laughs> I know it's hard to do, but a lot of us want to pack like eight outfits per day and you just don't need that, y'all. You're definitely not going to wear that much. And I promise you don't need all of those shoes. Another quick packing tip, start packing early. Are you stuck on the overpacking point we talked about earlier? Cause that tends to be your weakness. I've got advice. In addition to only bringing half of what you think you need, try packing early. Not like early in the morning, but early as in one or two weeks out. One of the reasons we often overpack is cause we wait until the last minute and end up just throwing in everything we think we might need, but probably won't use. So if you pack earlier instead of the day or night before your trip kicks off, you'll be able to take your time and mindfully decide what essentials need to come with you and what items are better off being left back home. This one is really cool and I did not know about it until Bria wrote this script. Download the T-Mobile Tuesdays app. All right, T-Mobile users, this one's for you specifically. You can download the T-Mobile Tuesdays app for some unique savings opportunities. Sometimes you'll get discount codes for rental cars, sometimes for hotels, sometimes gas. It just depends on the week. You'll just need to make an account and check in every Tuesday for a new discount code. Pretty cool. 
Know your rideshare locations. When you've landed in an awfully big airport and you're relying on a rideshare like Uber or Lyft to take you the rest of the way to your hotel, then you'll need to know where exactly those rideshares can pick you up. Airports will have designated rideshare pickup locations, but some can be trickier to track down than others, which is why, again, it's nice to look at a map ahead of time. At MCO, you're not necessarily going to see flashing neon signs that say rideshares here, but rideshare pickup locations will be located on level two of the A and B terminals, again, by baggage claim. MCO MCO Rideshare Pickup isn't the only rideshare location you'll need to know about before your Disney trip. If you plan on using rideshare to get around the parks, resorts, and Disney Springs area, you'll need to know exactly where you're going to be picked up in each of these places too. At Disney's Animal Kingdom, your rideshare will pick you up at the front of the park, off to the right side of the parking lot. At Disney's Hollywood Studios, you'll have to walk a little further to get to your rideshare since that pickup spot is in the last row of the bus station. Epcot's drop-off and pickup location is right as you get into the parking lot to your left, and Magic Kingdom's is the biggest pain of them all. You find your rideshare park near the bus terminal at the Transportation and Ticket Center, meaning you'll need to take a ferry or monorail over to the Transportation and Ticket Center if you're at the front of Magic Kingdom. For Disney Springs, you can find your rideshare at the Marketplace bus loop on the east side of the shopping district, which is tucked away behind the Marketplace businesses, like the Disney's Days of Christmas store, and sometimes there's also a pickup spot on the west side. But when it comes to the resort rideshare pickup spots, it all depends. Most of the time, you'll be able to get picked up and dropped off at the front entrance. Some resorts have multiple rideshare share locations that may be placed closer to where you are. For example, Disney's Animal Kingdom launch has two rideshare locations, one at Jumbo House and one at Kidani Village. And I've actually been able to have a rideshare pick me up in the Pumba area of the parking garage because it takes that long to get to the lobby. So I asked them to pick me up there and it worked out. This is another tip that's near and dear to my heart because of how many road trips I have taken. Always have half a tank of gas. If you're trying to decide whether your car's gas tank is half empty or half full, play it safe. You never know when you're gonna be stuck in traffic for hours due to a wreck or construction or rush hour in general. I can remember being stuck on a highway in Italy once and all around us, cars were just passing out because they ran out of gas. I think we were probably stuck there for a couple hours. Don't let that happen to you. If you have the opportunity to pull off at a gas station and little arrow on your gas gauge is starting to tip towards E, fill it up. It'll give everyone an opportunity to stretch their limbs anyways. You can buy some of those snacks if you didn't bring your own like we warned you to ahead of time. Definitely fill up the gas tank. You don't want to be in danger. You don't want to be in a situation where you might be stuck, especially in the middle of the night. Don't forget to bring those old headphones for flights. Several folks are starting to turn away from those headphones with the old school headphone jacks and trading them in for earbuds that are compatible with newer iPhone models. Or they're just not worrying about the earbud cords in general and are going the AirPods route. But lots of airplanes that have little TV screens built into the headrest still use the old headphone jack system. Flight attendants will usually hand out complimentary earbuds that are compatible with the plane screens, but that doesn't mean they won't run out of earbuds before they reach your seat. And those earbuds Earbuds are super cheap and usually they don't work very well. And I've been on lots of planes where they just don't do it at all. So go ahead and pack extra earbuds with traditional headphone jacks as a backup plan, or you can always get an adapter to switch your lightning cord earbuds into a traditional headphone jack. Know the Orlando roads that'll take you home. Planning on renting a car from MCO? Then you're gonna need to know how you get to Disney World from the airport. Sure, your Google Maps will be able to guide you straight away, but here's what your phone may not tell you directly. When you exit the airport, you have to decide on one of two routes. Both involve tolls, which is why change is important to have on hand. That's coming up later. The first exit is the one that'll lead you onto I-4, the Beachline Expressway, aka North Exit Road for Florida 528 West. This is the most direct route, but I-4 is not for the faint of heart. You're talking about heading down a major highway that's very congested with locals and tourists alike, especially during rush hour. If you want to bypass all of that, you may want to consider taking the second exit, the south exit road that leads you to Florida 417 South. This option bypasses I-4, but may take you a little more out of the way to get to your Disney World Resort. Okay, I did my job. Now the choice is in your hands. Use those hotel points. If you're a frequent traveler, or even if you're not a frequent traveler, but you enjoy the occasional trip, you're gonna wanna sign up for hotel rewards programs for the chain of hotels you tend to frequent the most. The more you stay at these hotels and the more you use your memberships, the more rewards you'll gain that you can use toward future visits. Some hotel reward programs offer a free night after a certain number of stays, and some rewards programs can be used for both hotels and flights too. But in general, points can be used to cut the cost of your hotel stays. So if you earn enough, you can can experience some major savings down the line.
You're also going to want to use those packing cubes when you are packing for your trip. This is another way to make sure you're not overpacking. If you want to save space in your suitcase while also keeping things organized, you may want to invest in these. Much like dresser drawers help separate your socks from your shirts, packing cubes will arrange your clothes and compress them down so you can fit more clothes and more items inside your limited amount of luggage space. Well, I guess that's not going to help with your overpacking, is it? Packing cubes can be found at places like Bed Bath & Beyond or, of course, the catch-all Amazon. Packing cubes do vary in size material and quantity so look at reviews and see how they are but I'd recommend getting a set of four to five so you can have different sizes and organization options to choose from sets usually fall in the 20 to 30 dollar range by the way I do use packing cubes for stuff they're not meant to be used for like external chargers but they are also really helpful for shoes to keep those from messing with everything else in your suitcase <laughs> Now this year we heard about tons of flight delays and cancellations. Airports were a mess. And that's enough to make you nervous about any flights you need to book. There's nothing you can do to prevent a cancellation or delay, but there is a way to better your odds. According to the New York Times, early morning flights are less likely to be affected by weather, staffing shortages, or planes arriving late to the gate. This is especially true in Orlando, since the weather usually hits in the afternoon. So the earlier you can book your flights, the better your chances at everything going according to plan. And even if your early flight still ends up getting canceled, you'll still have more chances to be placed on a new flight later on in the same day so you don't have to pay extra for a hotel room. And don't forget to download that airline app. Every airline has their own app that they'll beg you to download, and for good reason. Not only will airline apps be able to hold all your boarding information so you can easily access it whenever need be, but if there happens to be some sort of delay or gate change, your app will often be able to notify you about what's going on faster than the airline employees will. Your app will also be able to hold all your airline account information, like logging all your airline miles or helping you book your next flight. Not to mention airline apps make checking into your flight lots easier. Instead of going directly to the website, you'll just tap a few confirmation buttons on the app and there you go, you've got your boarding pass. So although you don't have to have these apps in order to fly, they do make things a whole lot easier. And I've had several times that my flight gate has been changed or even my flight has been delayed or canceled. And I found out first via the app notification, which meant that I could immediately get online and rebook a flight or change it appropriately. And that was super, super useful. Because if your flight's delayed or canceled, that means everybody else on your flight is also trying to change their flight at the same time. Now, speaking of those portable chargers that I just mentioned in the packing cube section, don't forget them. When you're on the road or in the air for a long stretch of time, more than likely you're going to use your phone or your devices. Your kid's going to be on their iPad. Maybe you'll listen to some music. You watch a movie, you browse through old pictures, play a little Zoom Zooms because you never got over that phase in your life. But after a while, you're going to start draining the battery, which is why you'll need your charging devices juiced up and ready to go. Having a portable charger is going to be great for several reasons. If the charging port in your car isn't working, you've got backup. If the charging port on the plane isn't working or doesn't even exist, you've got backup. When you finally get to Disney World and you're still having to use your phone constantly for the My Disney Experience app, you can restore that depleted battery super fast. Not to mention, if you buy a portable charger ahead of time in an electronics department or online, you'll more than likely get one for way cheaper than you will on Disney property or at the airport gift shops. If you're the type who tends to forget your portable charger back in the hotel room or you don't remember to charge it overnight so that it can actually do its job, you can always purchase one-time emergency portable chargers on Amazon to tuck away in your bag as a backup plan as well. These single-use chargers come in a 10 count for around 55 bucks on Amazon, so although it's ultimately cheaper and more efficient to get a reusable charger, it's nice to have these tucked away in your backpack or in your car or in your carry-on just in case you're needing your phone to give you directions to the nearest gas station but you're running on a solid 5% charge with no other alternatives. <laughs> This next one is another thing that you don't think about until you need it. Pack your gum. The ear popping you could experience on a flight when taking off or descending is no joke, especially if you have a cold or an ear infection. Some folks don't experience it whatsoever. Others get that annoying popcorn sensation. And then there are those ears that get really, really painful. Bring your gum. Chewing gum helps you produce saliva, which in turn forces you to swallow. And that swallow helps open up the tubes in your ears and give them a nice pop that can help relieve some of that clogged pressure. For babies and kids, make sure to pack a pacifier or have a bottle to give them before takeoff and landing to chew 
one and even act as a distraction. I flew with my baby a lot and having a bottle or pacifier was a lifesaver for him. They also sell little things called ear planes that you can put into your ears that are supposed to help with the pressure. Now I once did have to fly with an ear infection. It was incredibly painful and I brought these along and they helped a little bit. I don't know how they've helped you in the past. Let us know in the comments what you think. And this one you might not be sure about, but a lot of people swear by packing their own pillows. Let me know in the comments if this is you as well. Packing your pillow from home means you'll have guaranteed comfort at hotels. I've been to several hotels where the pillows are either too much or not enough, and you wind up with a stiff neck in the morning. But when you've got your trusty pillow, it'll help you get comfy faster so you can have a full night's rest. This is obviously not super easy to do if you're flying, but if you are driving, then this is totally doable. And if there are other comfort items that you need or your kid needs, go ahead and pack them if they fit. Things like loveys or stuffed animals or even blankets. I traveled with my kid's actual blanket from his bed for a long time because it helped him sleep when we were in hotels. And no, I will not be taking questions about that at this time. I know what it looks like. It's too much. I get it. Try a smaller airline for bigger dogs. Is Fido coming along with you on your flight? If you wanna bring your canine friend into the cabin, you can always look into flying on a smaller airline instead of one of the major airlines like American or United. Let's look at JSX. JSX is an airline with flights that only have 30 seats per plane. The terminals are private, you get two free check bags, and you'll get a complimentary cocktail while in air. And certain pets like dogs and cats can be transported in the main cabin too. According to the JSX website, small pets must fit comfortably in an approved carrier that is stowed underneath the seat in front of the owner for the duration of the flight. That's pretty standard for all airlines, right? But if you want to bring a medium to large dog onto the flight, that's okay too. Although smaller dogs and cats are free of charge and considered as part of your carry-on luggage, you will need to pay for an adjoining seat for any dogs that can't fit in a carrier comfortably. The dog will be permitted to lay on the floor directly in front of the seat. Of course, any and all pets are expected to be on their best behavior, but if you want to learn more about these pet policies, policies, check out the FAQ page at jsx.com. So this next one is a huge deal. It has happened to me and I don't want it to happen to you. Know what to do if you forget your ID. So you get up to the front of the TSA security checkpoint, you reach for your ID, your heart sinks. Where is your driver's license? Did you leave it in your wallet? Did you forget it at the lounge last night? Is it in your other bag back at the house? If you forget your ID for a flight, you're not completely out of luck though. No, I'm not saying there's a way you can fly without presenting some sort of ID to verify that it is really you who's gonna be boarding the plane, but you can go through a rather tedious TSA identity verification process instead. According to the TSA website, the TSA officer may ask you to complete an identity verification process, which includes collecting information like your name, current address, and other personal information to confirm your identity. After that process, if your identity is confirmed, you can enter a screening checkpoint, which may include additional steps like a pat down or an in-depth screening of carry-on items. This is why it's important to get to the airport early, my friends. If something like this does happen, it takes time to get it sorted out. So if you're already pressed for time, you may still wind up missing your flight. It may be a good idea to leave pictures of your ID and passport with a family member who can text them to you if there ever comes a time something like this pops up. Who knows, it could help the TSA identity verification process go faster since they'll already have your picture on them. I've also been told to leave photocopies of your ID and passport somewhere at home where someone can easily find them if need be, because the more ID proof you can have on hand, the better. And if you want the story, I left my driver's license at Via Napoli in Epcot and tried to get on a plane the next day and it did not go well. This next one has been helping me out a lot recently. Download some family-friendly podcasts. If you're doing a long car trip with the kids and you want to avoid the whole, are we there yet all the time, download a bunch of family-friendly podcasts that everyone in the car can enjoy listening to. This is good for kids who need a short break from all that screen time on their iPads because they're starting to get car sick from the winding roads. My family and I highly recommend something called Wow in the World from Guy Raz, which explores all these cool stories surrounding science, technology, and innovation. They're cute, they're a little annoying, but not too annoying, and they help us stay entertained and educated. Win-win. 
Okay, I love this tip. I hope you love it too. It's helped some of my friends ginormously. Use those air tags to track your luggage. If your check luggage doesn't arrive at your final destination along with you, you're gonna wonder where on earth it actually is. Some airline apps can help you track it down, but if it's really lost or even worse, it's somehow been stolen, it's nice to have an air tag that can help you pinpoint its location instead. Air tags are Apple devices that communicate through Bluetooth with your other Apple devices, like your Apple Watch, your iPhone, on your iPad or MacBook. It sends out a signal to help you find the exact distance between you and your AirTag, as well as what direction it's located. While AirTags are allowed in your checked luggage, other similar tracking devices with lithium batteries may not be. You can learn about what battery-operated devices are and are not allowed in checked bags through the FAA website. Now, another quick story time. My friend Heather flew to Italy last summer to get on a cruise the next day, and the luggage never showed up. Now, because she had AirTags, she saw when the luggage came to the Rome airport and was able to go grab her bags, even though the airline had not notified her that they were there yet. So if she hadn't had those air tags, she would not have gotten her luggage in time to get on the ship. It can make a huge, huge difference. Next tip, pack extra underwear in your carry-on. Just do it. Trust me on this one. They don't take up much room. It's worth it. All right, next tip. Know your assigned flight seat. I know this sounds like a no duh, right? If you didn't pre-select what kind of cabin seat you wanted beforehand and you just decide to choose one in the row you've been assigned at whim, you could cause quite the pickle later on for the passenger who did choose that seat beforehand and may have even paid extra to guarantee that spot. Swapping seats also becomes tricky for flight attendants who are having to get all the seat assignments figured out as everyone boards the plane. Having to deal with passengers switching things up on them at the last second and causing unnecessary confusion can make things more of a hassle and slow down the boarding process. If you wind up on a flight that isn't completely full, you may actually get the chance to choose a different seat after everyone's already boarded and accounted for. But full flight or not, it's always best to go to the seat you were originally assigned first and then ask about switching later. Again, just be cool, don't make it weird. You're also gonna wanna bring change with you when you travel. When you start to see the light at the end of the tunnel of your road trip, or you start seeing billboards advertising different Disney World attractions, you may think your trip should be a pretty straight shot from here on out. But don't forget about the toll roads. Orlando has a few toll booths you're gonna have to cross paths with before entering the city. Though many toll booths are switching over to a toll by plate system, where a picture of your plate will be taken and you'll be charged a bill in the mail later on, there are still a handful of cash-only tolls around Orlando. To play it safe, you may wanna keep a bunch of quarters on hand that you can easily access and toss into the toll collectors for a quick and easy transaction. And this next tip is one that I used a lot when I was a mom traveling with a toddler. Your toddler might be a bit too young to appreciate a good educational podcast, which is why I've got another entertainment solution for you. If you're traveling with a little one, wrap up a couple of little dollar store toys like coloring books and crayons or Hot Wheels or a cheapo magnet fishing toy or even homemade goodies like a plastic spice jar with some pipe cleaners to stick through the holes. That was a really popular one with my kid. You can dole these items out every couple of hours to keep them busy and keep them excited to see what comes up next. By the way, this was for before my kid cared about an iPad. Once your kid cares about an iPad, then you're all set. And the classic tip, stick to one carry-on and one personal bag. If you haven't already picked up on this, checked luggage can be an extra hassle. More often than not, you'll have to pay $30 for each checked bag and more if you wind up overpacking. So if you can stick to just a carry-on and a personal bag, you're gonna save yourself a lot of time and potentially a lot of money. If you don't plan on bringing home a lot of extra souvenirs from your trip and you're just trying to pack a bag for yourself and your necessities, you can condense and stick with one carry-on and one personal bag and still be good to go. That way you for sure know you've got all your stuff with you once you land. And Bria's got a personal tip for you. She's been packing duffel bags as her carry-on option lately over the regular less malleable suitcases because they're easy to squish into the overhead compartments if need be. There are times when a full flight leads to running out of overhead space, meaning your stuff will still have to ride with the checked baggage. You won't be charged for this, but it will kill time if you're running late for a connecting flight. Don't forget to check on credit card travel perks. Lots of airlines have their own credit cards that you can apply for if you're a frequent flyer. These credit cards are gonna help you earn rewards and different travel perks that you can use toward future flights, like getting you extra flight miles or a free checked bag, or even savings toward other travel expenses like hotels and dining and rental cars. Lots of times there is an annual fee attached to these, so make sure to read up on all the pros and cons for each airline's credit card before making that final decision. And these can also get you into airport lounges, which we're gonna talk about in just a second.
Don't forget also to write down important information. It's easy to get caught up in travel anxiety when your head is buzzing with things you need to for sure remember. So give your brain a little break and write down important travel information ahead of time. It's good to have a list that covers what you need to remember for the first 24 hours at your destination. Just in case you arrive late, your phone loses charge, or something else happens that feels more out of your control. Some of the things you're gonna wanna take note of include hotel or Airbnb addresses and phone numbers, taxi or rideshare service phone numbers, and flight connection information. Again, this is gonna be super helpful when your phone loses charge and you can't access that stuff anymore. So have that stuff just tucked away and ready to go, written down, in your actual handwriting and throw it in your carry-on bag. Okay, I promise to talk about airport lounges. Here we go. If you're at the airport and you got a super long layover ahead of you, airline lounges are available for certain passengers who've got that time to kill. These are peaceful escapes provided by select airlines that cater complimentary bites and drinks to guests as they bide their time and steer clear of all the congestion of the main airport areas. But you can't just waltz right on up and into a lounge. You have to be on the list, or rather you have to have approved access before stepping in there. There are several different ways to be granted access to an airline's lounge. My American Airlines credit card, for instance, gives me access to the American Airlines lounges at different airports. And if I got my husband a secondary card, which I haven't yet, he could get in too, even if he's traveling on his own. This is a sore spot and I have to get around to it. Lounge access is also granted to you when you reach an elite status with a certain airline, or you can skip the VIP status altogether and purchase a one day only lounge pass if available. Do look into this because these lounges can be really, really nice and useful if you need to get some work done before your flight. Now, if you don't know what airlines will have lounges at your connecting airport, download the Lounge Buddy app. App. Then you can get a feel for what lounge options can be available for you to potentially check out when you land. By the way, I've noticed that more and more airports, they have non-affiliated lounges, meaning lounges that aren't affiliated with a particular airline. These are lounges that anyone can go to if you pay the day pass fee. So definitely read up and Google to see if the airport you have a layover in has one of those lounges. Next on our list is traveling the day before. There's something thrilling about getting on a plane super early in the morning and ending up in the Magic Kingdom by lunchtime, but it's also a risky game to play. If you decide to fly in the day of your first park visit and your flight winds up being delayed or canceled, then what should have been a fun-filled day will wind up being a disappointing one and you lose a day of your vacation. Factor in the possibility of your flight not going exactly the way you planned and try aiming to arrive at your destination a day early. If everything goes well and you arrive at Disney World without any extra hiccups, then great, you have a whole extra day to explore the Disney Springs area or do a little resort hopping. And much like different airlines have different price points, different airports also have different prices too. That means the airport closest to you won't necessarily have better deals than the airport that's say half an hour away or two hours away. So don't just check on the price tags across multiple airlines, check multiple airports within your 120 mile radius as well. Apps like Skyscanner, Dollar Flight Club, and Google Flights can help you play the airport comparison game to find out which price tag's gonna be the best deal for you. You can also fly to and from different airports on your round trip flight. So for example, when I was living in New York City, sometimes it made more sense to fly into LaGuardia and out of Newark. You could save several hundred bucks that way. Next on our list, kind of gross, but very helpful. Find ways to cut down on car sickness. Just when you think everything's going super smoothly on your car ride, someone starts to feel a little nauseous, and maybe that someone is you. If you're prone to car sickness, there are some tips to cut down on that yucky feeling. First, you can call shotgun. Those riding in the front of the vehicle tend to be less susceptible to car sickness than those in the back, meaning if you're able, you might be less car sick being the driver too. Roll down the windows. Sometimes cars can get a little too stuffy, making it easier for you to get sick. So get some fresh air whenever you can. You can also take non-drowsy Dramamine. It's specifically made to help cut down on motion sickness, including motion via car ride. You can also buy yourself those weird looking motion sickness glasses. You know, the ones you've probably seen on TikTok with the literal four eyes concept. They may look goofy, but apparently they do a good job and they only cost like seven to $10 on Amazon. And don't drink several energy or caffeinated drinks in a row if you plan on driving later in the evening or super early in the morning. This can make you feel real sick too. And speaking of driving, don't forget to sign up for those fuel loyalty programs too. One of the major downsides of driving to and from Disney World has to do with those ever-increasing gas prices because they can be relentless. Much like airlines and hotels have loyalty programs to earn a certain percentage off your future travels, several chain gas stations like BP and Shell and Circle K also have memberships that you can sign up for. 
Fuel loyalty programs can help you save a few cents per gallon and earn rewards in the process too. Extra perks might include price matching, savings on car washes and in-store purchases, free fountain drinks for signing up, birthday rewards, and other unique benefits, depending on the membership. Many of these fuel loyalty programs are also free to sign up for, so you don't have to worry about dropping extra cash on a membership you rarely ever use. All right, if you don't do anything else from this video, do this, especially if you fly a lot. Purchase TSA PreCheck. Earlier, we mentioned how you can reserve your spot in the MCO security check line, but that's limited to strictly the MCO airport in Orlando and also boxes you into needing to arrive between 5 and 11 a.m. if you're gonna use that system. Otherwise, you're just gonna have to stand in a super long line like everybody else, and you're definitely still gonna have to take off your shoes when you go through the screening area, or will you? TSA PreCheck allows you to not only bypass the main security line for all participating airports, but also lets you keep your shoes on, keep everything in your bags, and breeze through security. So how do you apply for this pre-approval status? Well, all you have to do is go online to the TSA website and apply for pre-approval. You'll then book an interview where you'll need to provide a valid photo ID and proof of citizenship. Once you're approved, you'll be given a known traveler number that you can input when booking your flights. And lots of times, if you book with a specific airline most of the time, they will just fill that in for you automatically. This will give you access to a special pre-check lane at airport security where you're going to find you can move more quickly through security. MCO also has TSA pre-check enrollment office for anyone wanting to apply at the airport instead. The process is expedited, but it'll still take up to three to five business days for you to be officially approved. Best of all, TSA pre-check is currently cheaper than what it used to be. Originally, you'd have to pay 85 bucks, which could cover you for the next five years. Now the pre-approval status is $78 per person. And I'll tell you what, TSA PreCheck, especially at Orlando International Airport, will honestly save you at least 30 minutes, if not an hour at some points, because those lines are unbelievable. And remember how I said we're gonna talk about lost luggage a lot? Well, here we are again. Your checked bags have officially vanished to who knows where. You don't have a tracker, your airline has no idea what could have happened, so now what? Now you need to know what your compensation rights are. Each airline has different reimbursement rules that they must follow if they happen to misplace a passenger's luggage. So knowing exactly what you're entitled to puts the ball in your court. Let's look at a few lost luggage policies across some of the most popular airlines. American Airlines allows reimbursement for items you need immediately while away from home without your bags. Delta Airlines allows reasonable expense reimbursements around $50 per day for the first five days. And United Airlines allows reimbursement for expenses as long as you have reasonable proof of claim, meaning they're not gonna reimburse you for the beers you drank while trying to wash away your lost luggage woes. At the risk of sounding like a broken record, do your research for the airline you're flying with and make sure you're familiar with all the reimbursements you're entitled to have while the search continues for your wandering checked bag. Also, get air tags. And download entertainment ahead of time. We've got the podcasts, we've got the activity books, we've got the snacks, we've got the little crafts that aren't gonna make some big mess in the backseat of your car. What else could you possibly need? How about movies and shows? If you have a Disney Plus account, you can download things to watch from their streaming service before you head out on your mega road trip. All you gotta do is download that Disney Plus app and log into your account, find the movie or show you wanna download and tap that little download icon, which will be on the right side of the title if you're choosing a movie and to the right of the season number if you're choosing a TV show. Either way, it'll be that option with the arrow pointing down for download. This is gonna be super helpful if you're waiting in an airport forever and don't wanna get their Wi-Fi. If you're on an airplane and you don't wanna pay for Wi-Fi or the Wi-Fi you paid for doesn't work, cause that happens a lot too. Definitely have a few things downloaded, especially for the kids before you head out. Oh, and by the way, download your music too. A lot of times we just let our music live in the cloud and because we have access to Wi-Fi everywhere we go, it automatically plays for us and we wanna listen to something. But I was on a flight a while back and I really wanted to listen to a particular song. It's my work song. It's the song I work to and I listen to it over and over and over again and it's very motivating, but I hadn't downloaded it to my phone. So I couldn't listen to my work song while I was working on the airplane and it was super frustrating. So download your must have songs, make sure they're on your phone and you can access them without Wi-Fi if needed. 
All right, we've made it to our destination. Now it's time to ride some coasters, snack on sweets, and enjoy our well-deserved vacation. If you're in the process of planning on how you're going to navigate your journey to Disney World, remember to download today's list of easy travel tricks by going to disneyfoodblog.com slash easy travel and dropping us your email. And while you're at it, go ahead and drop some of your favorite travel tricks in the comments. 50 might seem like a lot of points, but there are hundreds of ways to make your trips so much easier on yourself. So share the wealth and make sure to tune back in to DFB for even more travel hacks and tips. Thanks for listening, everybody, and thanks for watching. As always, this is AJ for Disney Food Blog, and we'll see you real soon.